Today's message is a really important one because it's all about the power to change. And it's never too late to change. God still has a purpose for you. God still has a plan. And I'm going to illustrate this message from God's Word in a way that you'll never forget it by using butterflies. Just watch. You're watching a presentation of Carrie Shook Ministries. This broadcast is sponsored by the friends and, and partners like of Carrie Ship Ministries. Me, we thank are nice you schools, for helping to spread the love of Christ nice churches, throughout the world. There are nice parks, there are nice restaurants, there's nice Starbucks, all the things that make life worth living. <laughs> there are also nice houses filled with nice families who have nice dogs and nice cats and nice hamsters and nice goldfish. But just underneath the surface of all this niceness, it's not always so nice. I was at my 10-year-old son's basketball game the other day, and one of the dads started yelling at the coach. I mean, everyone forgets the Little League coach is just a dad who's volunteered to spend hours with our kids so the rest of us losers can just show up for the games <laughs> and criticize the coach. I thought the coach handled it pretty well. He stood up and he said, you cheer for your son, I'll coach the game. And then at the end of the game that we won, the coach pulled all the kids together in order to give them their treat and a little pep talk. But that dad came right back up to the coach, got right in his face and started yelling at the top of his lungs. I thought they were going to come to blows. But the coach, in order for it not to escalate, just took his kid and left. And then all the parents, we just grabbed our kids and we left. <laughs> but I noticed the dad's son... He was just looking down at his feet, totally humiliated. And I thought, another cul-de-sac casualty. And on the way home, I said, Stephen, I'm so sorry that that happened. That was just really bad. And he said, yeah, we didn't get our snack. <laughs> Kids have a lot better perspective than we parents do. But unfortunately, I've seen that scene played out over and over again at Little League Games and other venues. I was thinking about some friends of ours who just found out their teenage son has a terminal disease. And I thought, compared to that, what is a Little League game anyway? How important is it really? Well, it's important because my kid's in it. That's why it's important. But otherwise, it's just not that important. But we lose perspective real quickly in the suburbs. Because I've noticed underneath all the niceness, there's a lot of anger. I pulled out in front of someone the other day on the road. I didn't realize it until they honked at me and made sure that I realized it. And they pulled along beside me, and they gave me a hand gesture that I guess they were trying to tell me that I'm number one. I don't know. <laughs> and I do know what they were trying to tell me, so I just shot it right back at them. <laughs> no, I didn't do that. I'm, <laughs> I'm a pastor. We don't do those kind of things. We want to, but we can't. I've noticed underneath all the niceness, it's not always so nice. And underneath all the niceness, there's also a lot of hurt. Things look really good on the outside, but on the inside, every one of us carry around a lot of hurt, deep wounds and deep scars and deep stresses, and it affects us all. There's a societal disease that's sweeping through the suburbs, and it's sweeping through the cities, and none of us are immune to it. It's not a physical disease. It's a disease of the soul. There's an uneasiness in the soul, a discontentment, a restlessness of the soul that's inevitable in our modern society. It affects us all. The answer is nourish your soul and grow deep in Christ. So how do you nourish your soul and grow deep in Christ? Well, God led me to Romans chapter 12 because that has the answer to how we nourish our souls. So what I want us to do right now is focus on the first two verses of Romans chapter 12. Would you stand with me? And I want you to read this out loud with me together. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, 
to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. What he's saying here in this passage is what we need to heal our soul sickness is a transformation of the soul, sort of a soul awakening. And Romans chapter 12 gives us the antidote to all the sicknesses of the soul. So first I want to mention all the diseases of the soul that none of us are immune to and then show you from Romans chapter 12 the antidote. First is motion sickness. We're so busy moving so fast with our hectic schedules that our souls begin to atrophy. We start suffering from motion sickness of the soul. And what's the first thing we do when we start feeling this motion sickness of the soul? We start moving even faster. We're always moving to the next big thing trying to satisfy our soul. We're always looking for something new in order to satisfy our soul. Maybe it's a new house, a new car, a new spouse. Maybe it's the latest gadget with all the upgrades, but we're always looking for that next thing to satisfy the discontentment and restlessness that's in our soul. And I would say believers have motion sickness of the soul worse than anyone else because we're always looking for that next spiritual experience. And we think, well, maybe that's the answer. So we move to another thing and, oh, maybe that's the answer. We move to another thing and think, maybe that's the answer. Maybe it's the next best-selling Christian book or it's a new Bible study or a new spiritual high. We're always looking for that new spiritual experience that may fill the restlessness that's in our soul, this discontentment. And we're always looking for the answer. And we just don't find it. That's because you can't find it outside of you. I want you to see this word in Romans chapter 12 because this is the key to the whole series, transformed. Circle the word transformed. There's nothing wrong with all those good things that I just mentioned. It's just they will never satisfy the motion sickness in your soul. It's not an antidote to the motion sickness of your soul. That word transformed is the key. That word transformed comes from the Greek word metamorpho. It's where we get our word metamorphosis. And it literally means to be changed from the inside out. And that's the key. To be changed from the inside out. I like the way the message puts verse 2. It says, don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what He wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity. God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. The secret to Christian maturity is to be changed from the inside out. A metamorphosis of the soul. Now, when I think of the word metamorphosis, I think about a butterfly. I have up here some cocoons. And I think about the caterpillar and the process of transformation that it goes through as it crawls into a cocoon. And these are real cocoons up here, and some of them are already hatching. All of them will be hatched by tomorrow. But the butterfly goes into the cocoon, and a metamorphosis takes place, a transformation from the inside out, and it becomes one of these. Now, these are monarch butterflies, beautiful butterflies. Everybody knows about the monarch. Let's see if I can get one here. There. Now, the monarch butterfly is regal. It's beautiful. It's hard to believe that it started as an ugly caterpillar. Did you know the monarch butterfly is the fastest butterfly there is? Did you know that, sir? It can fly 17 miles per hour. It also travels thousands of miles every year, migrating from Canada all the way down to Mexico. It's pretty amazing. Now, last night, as I was showing everyone the monarch butterfly, We had one of those magical moments at Fellowship of the Woodlands. Well, you just have to see it to believe it. Show them, guys. Let's butterfly go. There, whoever it lands on has to give extra in their tithe. (laughs) That's what God just told me. We start playing the blame game. We feel this motion sickness of our soul. Look, it's coming right back to me. Yeah. Oh, no. Thank you, Lord. (laughs) 
I don't know what to say about that. <laughs> but I'm going to try it again. Who knows? Maybe it'll come back. There we go. It's triple the tithe for whoever it lands on this time. How about that? <laughs> it's a change from the inside out, a metamorphosis. But the problem is we try to change from the outside in, don't we? We're always trying to change from the outside in. And when you try to change from the outside in, you start playing the blame game. Well, the reason my soul is restless, it's my spouse's fault. No, it's my family's fault. No, it's my job's fault. No, it's my church's fault. And we move from one thing to the next thing to the next thing to the next thing because we think it's all about what's on the outside. We try to change from the outside in. And we blame everyone else for our lack of spiritual maturity. But I have to look into the mirror and I have to say I take responsibility for my spiritual growth because change from the inside out comes about when I decide I need to grow deep in my soul. And it needs to start on the inside, deep on the inside. I can't blame anyone else. I've got to look on the inside and I've got to have God transform me. I've got to have a metamorphosis of the soul. If you have to move one inch from where you are right now to be happy, you'll never be happy. Because it's not about what's on the outside, it's what's on the inside. And the antidote to the motion sickness of our soul is stillness. Write that down. It's the ancient art of just being still. You know, the caterpillar climbs into the cocoon and really works hard at becoming a butterfly. No. The caterpillar crawls into the cocoon and just relaxes. The caterpillar crawls into the cocoon and gets still and it stops moving and the transformation takes place. And transformation will never take place in my life until I get still, until I stop moving. I get still and I recognize that only God can change me from the inside out. Our problem is we're always trying to change from the outside in and we blame everybody else rather than looking within. But verse 2 tells us, instead fix your attention on God. Once you look at yourself and you say, I take responsibility for my spiritual growth and my soul being nourished, then the next step is I fix my attention on God. But I've got to get still in order to fix my attention on God. You can't fix your attention on God without getting still. Psalm 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. If I get still before God, I get transformed. I love that verse, Be still and know that I am God. When I get still before God, then I'm acknowledging that He is God and that I'm not and that He's in control. But when I try to fix everything and I do all these things to solve all my problems, then I'm trying to do it in and of my own strength. When was the last time you were still? You can't have restoration of your soul without stillness. Look at the next verse in Psalm 23. It says, He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Motion and commotion steals the soul, but stillness restores the soul. But underline the word makes. Many times God has to make me slow down. I'm not the type of person that just likes to slow down, so God has to make me slow down. Sometimes he makes you get down on your back to slow down. Sometimes you get sick for a few days and have to lay in bed. Sometimes you have to go to the hospital for weeks. But God will make you slow down because it's the only way your soul can be restored. So it's so much better just to slow down yourself, to find times where you can get quiet and you can be still. But there's a second disease that really relates to the first disease, and that is control fever. We try to control our image and act like we've got it all together so no one will know that we don't. We try to control our problems. We try to control our pain. We try to control other people, but they just won't cooperate, and it's so frustrating. If I could just control everyone and make them do what I wanted to, then the world would be in a great place, wouldn't it? But that's not the truth at all. But we're always trying to control. The quickest way to suffocate your soul is try to control everything. And the antidote to the control freak fever that we all experience is solitude, silence. When I get still and I get silent before God, He begins to restore my soul. Because when I get still and I get silent before God, I'm saying, God, I can't fix all my problems. I can't control everything. Most of life is out of my control. But it's in your control. You're God. And so I'm going to stop trying to be the general manager of the universe for a little bit and trust the world won't fall apart. And I'm going to get still and I'm going to get quiet. And I'm going to hear from you. I want you to begin restoring my soul. When's the last time you spent 30 minutes 
by yourself, alone in the quiet, not even praying, just being quiet, listening for God's still small voice. It's a lost art, this ancient discipline of solitude. You know, monks used to take vows of silence. And I did some study on this, and many of those monks that would take these vows of silence, they would then, after the vow of silence, go back into the city and they would minister to the poor. That's because when you spend time with God and God begins to transform you from the inside out, it eventually does come out and you make a difference. But when we try to change from the outside in, it never works. But God says, get quiet, get still, start developing that discipline where you have a time each and every day. Maybe it's 15 minutes, maybe it's 30 minutes. And every month or so you want to take a longer time of just being silent before God, being still, try it. It is very, very difficult because we're addicted to motion. We're addicted to noise. And our souls can never grow. Your soul will shrink with all the noise and all the motion that's all around us in society. Well, control freak fever is something we all suffer from. And Isaiah 30, 15 gives us the real answer. It says, This is what the Sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says, In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. Underline quietness and trust. If I stop trying to solve all my problems and control everything, quietness will fill my soul with strength. But then there's a third disease that I need an antidote to that we all are susceptible to, and that is status symbol syndrome. We're always comparing ourselves with everyone else to see where we stack up, and we use status symbols to compare ourselves. We're always comparing ourselves by looking at what they're wearing, uh, looking at where they're living, looking at where they're going on vacation, looking at what they're driving, looking at what their kids' grades are in school. We're always comparing ourselves to everyone else. And when you compare yourself to everyone else with status symbols to determine your status in life, your soul will shrink. There's nothing wrong with status symbols. It's just that when you use status symbols to determine your status by comparing yourselves to others, your soul will dry up. One of my dear friends lost all of his status symbols four or five years ago. They were stripped away completely, every one of them, when he lost his business and everything else. But today that man is one of the most godly and wonderful men I know. Totally contented, totally fulfilled. He has absolutely no status symbols that many people think are important. I have a very dear friend who's a CEO of a major corporation. And he has all the status symbols that everyone is always striving to get. He has those status symbols. And yet he is one of the most caring and godly men I know. Totally fulfilled. That's because he doesn't put any importance on those status symbols. It's okay to have status symbols. The, the problem is, is when we put importance on the unimportant. When you put importance on the unimportant like a status symbol, then your soul will begin to dry up. Look at Romans 12, 9. It says, love from the center of who you are. Don't fake it. If you make status symbols important, then what you're really trying to do is change from the outside in. And that's our problem. We think if I change my look... If I change my house, if I change my car, then it's going to change me and my soul will be content and I'll be happy and fulfilled and it never works. Transformation metamorphosis takes place from the inside out, not from the outside in. It's interesting to know that the coloring on a butterfly is not caused by pigment. It's caused by a prism-like effect where the light is reflected off the transparent wings. Pretty amazing to think their wings are transparent. But in life, transparency transforms. When I get real with God and others, when I be who God created me to be rather than trying to pretend like I'm someone else, when I'm real, when I don't worry about status symbols, when I don't compare myself to everyone else according to the status symbols that I have, God says that's when my life gets transformed, being real. The opposite of the word metamorphosis is a Greek word, metaschematizo. And that word is where we get our word masquerade, putting on masks and masquerading. And it literally means to change the outward appearance. So the opposite of metamorphosis, to change from the inside out, is metaschematizo, which means to change the outward appearance, to masquerade. Too many times we masquerade like we've got it all together when we're hurting so deeply in our souls. And God says, you need a metamorphosis not masquerade. 
You need to change from the inside out that's real, and it will affect what's on the outside. But first, it takes place on the inside. Now, the only antidote I know to this status symbol syndrome is service. Uh, you know, I, I've just tried many different things over the years, but there's only one thing that works, and that's service. And not just service, but serving people who can't really serve you back or can't give anything back to you because we're great networkers. The only thing you can do is give to someone to make a difference in someone's life where they can't do anything back for you in return. That's the only thing that breaks that grip. In Romans 12, 16, it says, don't be stuck up. Make friends with nobodies and don't be the great somebody. It's not about networking, just about serving but then there's a fourth disease that really affects us all from the suburbs to the cities, and that is comfort zone virus. My goal in life becomes to be comfortable. I want to be comfortable. Avoid pain at all costs. I was talking to a pastor friend of mine this week, and he said, Carrie, I want you to go with me to climb Mount Everest. And I said, why? You know? And he said, well, I've gone a couple of times that I've made it to base camp, 18,000 feet, and you would love it. And he kind of looked at me and he said, I think you're in shape enough to do it. You know, he was not quite sure. It took him a while to come to that conclusion. But he said, it would be great. You would love it. It would be such a great time. And I, I love this guy. And I thought, you know, that would be so much fun. I mean, base camp, I could probably do that. How hard is that, 18,000 feet? It's not like I'm climbing to the top of Everest. And I said, nobody dies at base camp, do they? And he said, oh, yeah, all the time. <laughs> He said, yeah, you just you walk past dead, frozen bodies all the way up. And I said, you're kidding. He said, yeah, it's altitude sickness. They don't realize it until it's too late. Their bodies don't adjust, and boom, they're down. And there's really nothing you can do. If someone dies up there, they can't get a helicopter up there. So there, you stay. So I said, you know what? Get another pastor friend, because <laughs> God has not called me to do that. Now, I mean, if God calls me to go on a mission trip at a place that's very, very dangerous and my life is in danger and something were to happen to me, then, then I think that would be called martyrdom. But if I died on Mount Everest because I wanted to go there, that would be called stupidity. <laughs> so many Christians think the Christian life is, get comfortable. That's what it's all about. No, comfort zone virus will steal your happiness and it will shrink your soul. If you're always looking to get all the problems out of your life so you can be comfortable, then your soul will die. And you wonder why you're feeling a restlessness in your soul? It's because you're trying to get comfortable. It says in verse 12, base your happiness in Christ. If trials come, endure them patiently. Is that what it says? Wait a minute. It doesn't say if, does it? It says when trials come. It's not if, but when. You will have trials in life. You will have problems. You will experience suffering. Doesn't matter if you live in the suburbs or the cities or in a third world country, suffering will come into your life. No one is exempt from tragedies. No one is exempt from problems. But just know that during the middle of the problem, there is a purpose. God has a purpose. I heard the story of a little boy who found a cocoon upon a branch and he saw it was moving and then he saw that a butterfly was struggling to break through. And he felt sorry for the butterfly, so he took out his pocket knife and wanted to help the butterfly avoid the struggle. He cut open the cocoon. He pulled the butterfly out. He held it in his hand, and he expected it to fly away, but it didn't move. Within minutes, the butterfly was dead. That butterfly needed the struggle to strengthen its wings. It needed the struggle in order to soar. And you need the struggles in order to soar. There's no way that you can be changed from the inside out without struggles and problems and pain. And God allows that into our life because the only antidote to the comfort zone virus is suffering. Because you don't have to go looking for suffering. Suffering will come into your life. Every one of us go through deep hurts and wounds, and you cannot avoid tragedies. I wish I could stand up here and say, you'll never have a problem, you'll never have a tragedy, you'll never have a death in your family, you'll never have anything wrong happen. But I can't say that because suffering comes to every one of us. But just know this. God doesn't cause the suffering, but he allows it to strengthen your wings so that you can soar because without suffering, your soul will die. The comfort zone virus kills more souls than anything else. 